In the far north of the Northern Hemisphere, around the rim of the Arctic Circle, the world's largest land-based predators roam unchallenged by natural enemies. In one of the last great wilderness habitats on Earth, there are around 25,000 polar bears, the only species of bear protected by five nations. Evolved from the brown bears of North America and Europe, polar bears are finely adapted to sub-zero conditions, expertly conserving energy and heat. But could an environment be created for polar bears at the opposite end of the Earth, using advances in zoo technology and movie special effects? That's the challenge facing SeaWorld on the subtropical coast of Australia we're planning for a state-of-the-art polar bear exhibit has been going on for more than two years. We've got to be able to not let the bears get to the fans. Well, that bear's in scale, is he? One to 50 scale. So we've got that fan there. Now, there you go there. <laughs> Obviously, we're going to have to move that up. Des Spittall will be one of three keepers assigned to care for the polar bears, the only one with polar bear experience. I've worked with bears before in the past in uh, a couple of zoos in Australia and you know, this is nothing like traditional bear exhibits that the zoos used to have. Quite literally the bears used to be in pits. That's, that log has got to be able for a bear to come out on that log. Their lives weren't exactly uh, fulfilling, shall we say. A facility like this is going to totally enrich the animal's life all the way through. This is going to be good, I think, the, 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 high, the high level viewing. These animals are going to be able to see right over this glass here and they'll have they'll have that, that high position of being the dominant animal over the people. SeaWorld's exhibit will be based on conditions around Churchill, Manitoba, a small town on the shores of Hudson Bay in Canada. Here, winter temperatures can reach minus 30 degrees Celsius, 55 degrees Fahrenheit below. But in summer, it can be as warm as 20 to 30 degrees Celsius, up to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Churchill has a population of only about a thousand people, but every year thousands of tourists come to see the world's most southerly population of polar bears. Once a military town and a trading port, Churchill's been built on a polar bear migration route. And until the Department of Natural Resources stepped in, many bears were shot in defense of life and property. Churchill is a unique uh, town. I don't think you'll find many places like it in the world. Here it is in the middle of a, of a polar bear migration route and there's people living there and people coming from around the world to see polar bears. But at the same time, we have to protect those people and we have to protect the property. The bears over there. Government rangers set traps and snares on the perimeter of the town and check them regularly. They also keep a close watch for bears roaming in the distance. The biggest problem is, is when they get into town. So we have our control zone set up. If a bear crosses that line, we either trap them or snare them or uh, free range them with a dart gun. Polar bears can, can become very aggressive. We usually have a human fatality caused by polar bears one every decade. And, uh, and we, we, as much as we strive to, we want to minimize that. And that's why we have the alert program we have. It's been in place now for almost 30 years, but it's one that's evolving all the time. Every year we, we see ways to improve the program and to protect the people better, but minimize the impact upon the bears themselves. As we value those bears. Polar bears generally start to get Wildlife officer Ron Larsh tracked Churchill's polar bears for more than 20 years. About 1,200 make the annual migration. As the winter progresses, the, the bears tend to start off heading north out onto the bay, and then they eventually start swinging eastward and then southward, and they almost make a circle over the course of the winter. Bears who come too close to town are taken to the polar bear compound just outside Churchill. Here, they're confined for their own safety until the pack ice returns to Hudson Bay. Because the polar bears around Churchill eat very little through summer and autumn, they'll be fed nothing but snow. But they'll pick up their northward migration unharmed in late November. The people of Churchill are proud of their peaceful coexistence with one of the animal kingdom's most dangerous predators. Some zoologists believe they're the only bear that regards humans as prey. 
The town that calls itself the polar bear capital of the world once had a population of more than 14,000. Now there are more bears than people, and Churchill has built a thriving tourist industry around the most accessible polar bears on Earth. It's a good, uh, a good boost for the town bear season. It brings in lots of tourists and lots of tourist dollars, yeah. In the last three or four years, they broke into the odd house and pushed the side in or pushed the window in. No humans were hurt. Yeah, they're still a wild animal, yeah. When Churchill's polar bear compound starts to reach full capacity, Pat Cronin from the Polar Bear Alert Program will relocate one of the inmates by helicopter. We'll fly them north of town, about 30 miles, where they'll carry on their migration north. Hopefully stay out of trouble. The Hudson Bay population of polar bears has almost doubled since the 60s when the polar bear patrols began. But now that human activities have been brought under control, climate changes may be a bigger long-term threat. We are concerned that, um, that that population may start to decline with global warming. We believe that the, um, well, the last decade, the period that we've had ice on Hudson Bay when the polar bears can get out and hunt seals, that period has been decreasing quite dramatically, uh, down about uh, four weeks less than it used to be. And we're noticing now that the average weights of polar bears has declined. And so there is some concern for polar bears in the future. For the time being, this particular bear will be fine. An adolescent male, four or five years old, weighing 200 kilos, around 440 pounds. He's released about half an hour's flying time north of Churchill, near a disused trapper's cabin. They'll wake up in oh, about an hour or two hours be a little drowsy for a while and then hopefully he'll continue north and hopefully he won't come into town again or close to town. As a direct result of their work with bears in the wild, the Manitoba Department of Natural Resources has also taken steps to protect bears in captivity, writing the world's most stringent guidelines for keeping polar bears in zoos. We have polar bears uh, that we can donate to zoos, but we want to make sure that they're going to good homes that they're going to be respected and it's going to help spread the word that Manitoba has these unique animals and we're not going to just allow them to go to a facility where they're not going to be well taken care of. Australia's polar bears won't come from the wild, but SeaWorld's planned exhibit will exceed the Manitoba guidelines. A two-year search of the world's zoos has located two polar bears available for breeding loan to Australia. One is part of a family group in Beijing Zoo in China. The other is a mature female bear living alone in Tucson, Arizona. Canuck was born and raised in Knoxville, Tennessee. She's already acclimatized to warmer conditions. The polar bears are due to arrive in Australia in less than 30 days. SeaWorld's marine sciences manager, Trevor Long, is fast-tracking construction of their new quarters. This is the underwater section of the pool. It holds 600,000 litres of water and it turns over every hour. Because these animals are really a sea bear and they'll spend a lot of time in this water. This water is chilled down to 15 degrees C. Because these underwater viewing panels behind us um, they're only half covered with water, so you can see the top of the exhibit as well as the underwater. And we'll have live fish in it. However, we don't want the fish to be consumed. You'll see a lot of hidey holes. We're given a lot of um, safe havens for the fish that they can get in and get away from the bears. So these are actually fiberglass reinforced panels taken off real rocks. 
This point here on the corner is a very important point. What we have there is a safe haven, and that's for keepers. This is designed so there's a very narrow gap that someone can squeeze through very quickly, retreat up into here into this void, and there'll be an alarm button here that they press an alarm button, hey, I've got a problem, come and take this bear away. The keeper who'll be in charge of Australia's only polar bears is Kerry Haynes Lovell. After a four-week study tour of US zoos with polar bears, she's arrived in Tucson to meet Canuck. This is Canuck here. Yep, there she is right there. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Hello. What a good girl. Well, Canuck, this is Kerry. Hi, Canuck. In a couple of weeks, she's the one that's going to be taking care of you. Kerry has worked with large carnivores before. She once hand-raised a Sumatran tiger. Oh, oh mm. big stretch. She's cared for elephants and rhinos, hippos and giraffes, but never polar bears. What's that? I love their lips. You're a good girl. Hey, what's up here? She says, I'll come with you as long as they have bread, bread. in Australia. We have lots of bread. Bread's my favorite too. <laughs> now she's had some battles in her life that are not documented. She okay. had, her nose has been broken. Okay. And she's missing a piece of ear. Okay. Good girl. Well, this is pretty good. Sometimes when people come to visit, she gets a little aggressive and, you know, jumps at them. She's been very calm. Yeah. Animals are unpredictable. Canuck doesn't know me. Um, she could just have easily have looked at me and turned her, her, uh, her head away and gone, well, there's yes, okay, somebody else here. She's a, a gentle lady, as gentle as a bear could be. I think she's going to be a very nice bear to work with. You're a good girl. Hey? I won't let that boy from Beijing pick on you either. Carrie's going to teach you how to do all kinds of stuff. Carrie is an animal yeah. trainer as well as a keeper. Although yeah, Canuck won't be trained to perform, yeah. all zoo animals are taught certain behaviours that allow their handlers to examine them. So what, what behaviours does she know, like husbandry behaviours? She doesn't know much, to tell you the truth, so I can see if she'll stand up now. Okay. Canuck, up, up. But of course, this is very typical for her to look around and have to think about it. Up. Talking to the guys at San Diego, it was the same thing. They said you just have to be patient. Yeah, with they them. don't. They don't do things quickly. This I always liked because, especially with our other male, we've had Good foot girl. problems, and it was nice to be able to get them to stand up so that you would look at their feet. There we go, and up. Leslie Waters has been Canucks keeper for four years since the bear was transferred from Knoxville, Tennessee. She'll be travelling with Canuck to Australia and waiting till she settles in. I got what I needed. Good girl. <laughs> it's going to be strange. It's going to be strange to not have her here, but I've never felt so good about a, one of my animals leaving. She's going to live in a multi-million dollar exhibit that I don't even think anywhere in the United States would be as nice. So how could I be anything but happy for her? She likes to... Uh, Apples and carrots. She likes crunchy, crunchy things. things. Celery. Canuck has had three cubs in two litters, but has never been able to raise them. The hope is that in more ideal conditions, with a new mate, she might make a success of motherhood. And at 16, she's still capable of breeding. Uh, 16 is is not uh, not too old for a polar bear. They can certainly live into their 30s, and if she gets started before she gets too much older, then she can probably have uh, a few litters. Tim French tracks the captive breeding of polar bears throughout North America. Uh, well, we've been involved with, with SeaWorld of Australia um, since before they started the process uh, of, of their exhibit development, and uh, they, they contacted us early on, and uh, we're seeking advice on, on exhibit design and development, uh, as well as animal acquisition. Australia's polar bears will come under the supervision of the American Zoo and Aquarium Association, whose animal population biologists meet regularly to monitor captive breeding throughout the U.S. We're going to face the same thing with polar bears, that they do live way into their 30s and they can't... The Bear them. Committee of the American Zoo Association is meeting in Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago. It's chaired by Diana Weinhardt, once a keeper of spectacled bears. And one of the scientific Hi. matchmakers who found polar bears for Australia. This was not uh, an easy thing to pull off. I mean, it was truly an international project. We wanted it to matter. We wanted it to be a scientific matching that will benefit the population. So when the polar bear from China and the polar bear from Arizona hopefully have cubs, they will be coming back to North America. 
And so that flood line that was in China will be now in the United States, which will benefit us since right now we don't have a lot of access to other bloodlines for polar bears. Maintaining genetic diversity in small populations is not only a problem for animals in captivity. Population biologist Dr. Steve Thompson is pioneering new techniques that can be applied to dwindling populations in the wild. Population size is very important for preserving both captive populations and wild populations, and so the analytical techniques that we employ now have been developed and, and actually are being tested on these zoo populations. Part of the theory is that if we can develop uh, management programs that work for a population where you control everything, then it would be easier to export that to management of wild populations. And in fact, um, we're already doing that. <laughs> Zoos already committed to scientific research are re-emphasizing education for children and behavioral enrichment for animals. That's the art of preventing boredom for animals in human care. A unique program at Reed Park Zoo in Tucson combines both. Don't make it easy for the polar bear. Today, preschoolers are being given the chance to entertain Canuck by hiding special food in her exhibit, guided by education officer Vivian Van Pino. So what type of treats do you think we should give the polar bear today? Grape jelly. And if you were to maybe hide the jelly under a piece of the tree, she'd have to look for it. Or if you were to smear it on the wall, she'd have to smell it out and maybe go over and lick it later. We're going to go stand up there. We have to hurry so the polar bear can come eat. It is difficult and it's very different when you work with animals in human care. You try not obviously to become too attached to an animal because you work with a lot of animals. And but unless you have that empathy, with the animal, I don't really believe that you can work well with it. I think it's more a respect that you have for the potential and the, the natural ability of the animal. We have great affection for the animals that we work with. And there are individual animals that you'll work with in your life that hold a, a special meaning for you. Canuck could end up being one of those animals. Trevor Long has come to Manitoba to meet one of the Polar Bear Project's most important advisors after months of communicating by phone and fax. Ron Larsh from Manitoba's Department of Natural Resources who wrote the guidelines for keeping polar bears in captivity. Hi, Trevor. Ron, how Glad are you? Glad to meet you. I'm wonderful. There she is. Look, she's got a bucket. Kerry is spending oh, her days with Leslie and discovering the detail of Canuck's care and keeping. And what temperature does she she not go in the pool? Like um, what? starts the lower 60s. Lower 60s. Lower 60s, but she often uh, will put a toe in and say, you know, pull back, like, hmm. If she does think, as if she thinks it's too cold. Okay. <laughs> so, so I always joke, just, just say she's... She's in Arizona, bit. Yeah, well, she came from Tennessee, but I think it gets colder in Knoxville than it maybe does even here, I'm not sure. But uh, she doesn't do a lot of swimming in the win winter. In the winter time. Yeah, so. Well, we'll probably have to uh, not have the chillers on to start with so that she doesn't. Yeah, uh, but except for your, when she gets to Australia, it'll be a lot warmer outside than it is well, here right now. Well, that's true. So she may be uh, more, more inclined. inclined to get into the pool. Okay. We, we even had some zoos uh, refuse to cooperate with our committee saying that uh, we should be not drawing up any guidelines on how zoos should be run and it should be not be done by people from natural resources and certainly not by a, uh, a, an arm of government. And there's not too many zoos that meet those standards. No. Actually very, very few. Very, very few. Isn't this fun? I want to always throw her stuff everywhere just to give her something yeah. to do. Well, it's still better than putting it in a dish. Right. right. I was looking at things of what we can do to enrich the animal and to mm -hmm. make it as natural as we can. So we thought the things like wind, mm -hmm. wind and rain and mm -hmm. the misting, as yeah. well as we're going to have a small ice machine, we'll be able to put in oh, a yeah. lot of shaved ice in here okay. as well. Oh, great. 
The Manitoba guidelines define more than just the physical dimensions of the exhibit, its overall size, the depth and temperature of the water. They're also concerned with behavioural enrichment, giving captive animals challenges and constant changes. There's a large foraging pit here. Where are we going to put bark, whether it want to be loam, whether it be yeah. gravel or whatever, something mm. that's interesting for the animals to dig right. and play, yeah. and they'll hide food into that. Yeah. And I think that's the other thing that's, that, that is required. Uh, you have to do everything, especially at a small zoo. We don't have someone that comes in and cleans our pools. You're involved in every aspect, and that I like. They're for all intents and purposes, they feel like they're yours, but they're not. You have a relationship with them that uh, few other people would ever have with that animal. As she shares with Kerry the physical tasks of caring for Canuck, Leslie passes on her intuitive knowledge, a crucial part of handing over the polar bear that has come to feel like hers. Information that will be vital when Canuck is half a world away in Australia. A group of school children have come to the zoo to say goodbye to Canuck. Then there's also going to be a male polar bear. His name is Ping Ping. Where would an animal named Ping Ping come from? China. He's coming from China. He's going to come all the way from China and he's going to get there probably a day or two after Canuck gets there. Are they going to have babies? Well, they might. <laughs> We're not exactly sure yet, and we always have to wait for recommendations from the scientists to decide if it's time for them to breed or not. Is it going to be on the news? Yes. Do you know what? This is pretty exciting in Australia. It's exciting for us here at the Reed Park Zoo, but I think it's even more exciting for the people in Australia because Canuck will be the I've only worked with a lot of big animals before, but of course the polar bear is the largest carnivore in the world. I don't consider the danger to be the most important thing for me to know. It's always in the back of my mind and you always have to be very conscious of the fact that they have the potential. But for me, the animal is the most interesting, exciting thing to work with. The lock on the gate at the back of Canuck's exhibit has collapsed. Although it appears to be locked, Leslie's unsure if she can trust the things it. Things that happen to me in a day, I'll tell you. It's okay, Canuck, we'll get to it. Okay? <laughs> this crate is big enough where she can stand up, she can turn around, she can get some food, she can get some water, and again, she's going to have her zookeepers with her the whole time, too. So yeah, they're going to be in the cage with the polar bear? No, not <laughs> in the cage. What do you think? I got another lock for the door. I called, it. called the other one in, the broken lock in. Polar bear keepers all over the world make it a rule to keep two locked gates between humans and polar bears at all times. Yeah, you're wondering what we're doing with this door, aren't you? <laughs> Having lock problems around a polar bear is not a good thing. Now this skull is actually of a very large male polar bear. This is probably as big as Ping Ping will be when he gets to be full grown. The thing is, look at these bones right here. See how large they are and how far they stick out on the side of the head. Imagine how many muscles can attach to this big cheekbone so that they have so much power to close their jaws and to chew. These children have been coming to the zoo every month as part of a project to design their own ideal captive habitat, an assignment for their full-time teacher, Dan Dolan. The neat thing is, is that the lesson doesn't end at the zoo. It's not going to be something that is just uh, today or tomorrow, uh, but will have long-lasting impacts, not only on how well they read and how well they write, but how they think and how they appreciate the things that are around them. On the day she leaves Tucson, Canuck will be anaesthetised with a dart gun. While she's unconscious, a vet will take a blood sample to check her general health. Then she'll be lifted into the transport crate. Absolutely perfect. It couldn't have gone any better. She's down and they're going ahead and drawing the blood right now. I just want to make sure that she'll be as comfortable as possible and uh, not too frightened by the airplane. When she was transported from her only other home, she was transported in a vehicle. I'm a little worried about her feelings on the pressure changes and a very grueling, pretty much two-day trip. It's going to be a frightening experience for her. It will be a long haul for her and, and I think um, speaking to people who have transported animals, and I've spoken to quite a few who have transported bears in my time here, 
little bit more. They're saying that once the animal's moving, they seem to actually enjoy some of it because it's different. Good, 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 good. good. Canuck would remain unconscious for 24 hours if the anaesthetic were not reversed. Now she's woken up with an injection of naltrexone. She's gone through this procedure many times for routine medical checks with no ill effects. Within minutes, she begins pouring at the mesh. A good sign, according to vet Jim Stoft. Oh yeah, I think she's, she's pretty much reversed back out to where, where she was right before we darted her. She's going to be a little drowsy for the next couple of hours. I think she'll settle down. I don't think she's going to be this uh, riled up the whole way. I think she's going to settle down. Leslie screams the crate, hoping Canuck will settle down better if she can't see out. Canuck will make the 12-hour journey to Los Angeles in a refrigerated 18-wheel semi-trailer to make sure there's enough recirculating air. Are you going to miss me when I'm in Australia? Yeah. The convoy leaves just after sunset and the temperature is falling. The second semi-trailer travels behind as backup in case something goes wrong with the first. Less than 20 minutes out of Tucson, the transfer is in jeopardy. Yeah. Bleeding already. I felt a rocking back here and uh, it's not happening. Kanook has been scraping her nose on the crate's double mesh. Although it protects the bear and her handlers from accidental intrusions, it limits their access during the transfer. They also have no drugs and no mobile phone. Ed, this is Leslie. Um, we've got a bit of a problem. Her head is already bloody. Her head is already all bloody. I mean, pretty darn bloody. Kerry uses her experience as an animal trainer to try to interrupt Canuck's behavior pattern, gently squirting her with water whenever she rubs on the mesh. Vet Jim Stoft and zoo supervisor Ed Hansen drive out from Tucson bringing with them tranquilizers, injectable and oral. The original plan, that Canuck could make the trip with no sedation, has been abandoned. I think it's just a nose, I don't think it's her eye. And every time she went to rub her head I squirted her with water. A lot of blood. Yeah, well, a lot of that's washed. We yeah. washed a lot of it off. Yeah, it's impossible to give Canuck a sedative by injection. The mesh is too fine. But Kerry is able to feed her chocolate bars laced with an animal tranquilizer known as Ace Promazine. Ed Hansen gives Leslie the option of abandoning the transfer. The options are, if you feel comfortable, we're going to send her on down the road now. Does she got okay. enough Ace Promazine right now? Well, if she's going to get 100 milligrams of Ace, we'll send her down the road. I'm hoping that she will settle in. Okay. If she doesn't settle in and you feel uncomfortable in L.A., call the vet. Go with what the vet says. Okay. Okay. And if you want to call it off at any point, you got to call us and tell us this ain't going to work, and then we'll make the decision how to get the animal back. Okay. How many dos How many pills do we have? Uh, we've got. Uh, I think I've got. We've got enough to get you there. Canuck's journey has had an anxious beginning. Ahead are 300 miles, nearly 500 kilometers, by road to Los Angeles, then a long plane ride to Australia. But as the night wears on, Canuck improves. She's stopped scraping her nose, and her injury appears to be only superficial. A graze about an inch wide. She drinks water and takes a little food. The tranquilizers are working. Next morning in Los Angeles, a sheet metal worker is called in to modify the crate, installing a piece of smooth aluminium inside the mesh. Leslie, 
me. How did you know? Because I have caller ID. Oh, oh, you're on speakerphone, Ed. Yeah, you're right. Well, we're here. Let's have it. We've been here for a while. Things have been going okay. We've been giving her uh, some ace promazine when, when we're supposed to. Uh -huh. She hasn't gotten any worse. Uh, and we just were able to uh, get the sheet metal put in. On, uh, it's aluminum, actually. And Perfect. She's eaten something and drunk every time we've stopped. Okay, great. We didn't call the vet. We feel like we're in pretty good shape. We have enough pills, and she hasn't gotten any worse. So. Ma'am, I think you got, you're doing the right thing. We're going to keep trucking. Canuck is loaded just after sunset, 24 hours after leaving Arizona. The freight plane she's travelling in will make three stops and it'll be 27 hours before she arrives in Sydney. In Beijing, Ping Ping has been separated from his family group and moved to another part of the zoo for 30 days quarantine. Trevor Long has arrived to collect him. On the day Ping Ping leaves, Chinese journalists ask the same questions they ask in other countries. Isn't Australia too hot for polar bears? Isn't it too far? So I think that the polar bears in Australia is no different than koalas being in Japan or America. These animals are very adaptive. Ping Ping, almost five years old, seems to have a completely different approach to travel from Canuck. Ping Ping was a very confident animal. Any new smell he was interested in any new sight was interesting, so it was all quite stimulating for him. And I think when he was on a trolley at an airport getting taken around in the trolley, well, he thought this was just wonderful. Ping Ping will fly from Beijing to Hong Kong and then direct to Australia. He's due in Sydney about 12 hours after Canuck. And Canuck is about to arrive. 30, 20, 10. She won't be the first polar bear ever to live in Australia, but for today at least, she's the only one in the country. And Kerry Haynes Lovell has begun one of the most demanding zookeeping jobs in Australia. It's huge. If I think about it, it's quite scary. But I guess in, in the long run, I'm an animal care person. That's what I do, that's what I've done all my life. I find it extremely exciting because I haven't had this ability to be able to work with these animals so closely before. So a lot of the joy I feel about doing this overrides the worry, I guess. In Sydney, Canuck is examined by vet Julie Barnes from Taronga Park Zoo. Although she's no longer hurting herself on the crate, Canuck remains restless. Well, let's try the oral okay. I mean, injectable would be far more reliable. Uh, but so you just piss her off. Yeah. Okay. What we yeah. might do is we'll go and do a, a Twix bar run. <laughs> okay, well, while you do that, I'll sort out some tablets. I hope I've got enough, because that's what I'm worried about. It, it's very similar to the ace chromazine she's been getting. The bear is OK, although her keepers are close to exhaustion. But after travelling for almost two days, they're only a couple of hours from home. Meanwhile, Ping Ping has arrived in Hong Kong, accompanied by his Chinese keepers and Trevor Long. They have no trouble with the bear, only with the bureaucracy. Uh, getting Ping Ping out of China was very frustrating, um, very difficult. There's a lot of paperwork involved, and therefore you're dealing with a language barrier, you're dealing with people who don't know you. Every I's got to be dotted and every T's got to be crossed. And it wasn't just a matter of booking a plane, you just don't go and book a plane to move a polar bear. It's been an enormous planning job. I didn't really consider that at the start. I don't think any of us did. Canuck by this time has arrived in Brisbane for the final leg of her journey by road. Again, she'll ride in a refrigerated truck with a second one travelling yeah, behind right. as backup. This time she might need refrigeration. It's a lot warmer here than the night she left Tucson.
Canuck arrives in the rain at night, but everyone's delighted. We're home. We're home. We're going to be mates and buddies for two weeks. <laughs> See what happens. <laughs> Canuck has travelled 12,000 kilometres, 8,000 miles from her home in Tucson. She's been restless and agitated much of the way. But now she's arrived at SeaWorld, she hesitates about leaving her crate. I wasn't at all surprised that she didn't want to get out. As much as she thought she wanted to get out the whole trip, when faced with something strange awaiting her, she decided she would stay there because that was something she knew at least. She was acting very Canuck-like. <laughs> the dens attached to the SeaWorld exhibit will be the bear's quarantine quarters for the next 30 days. Canuck investigates her straw-filled sleeping den and her chilled swimming pool. But it isn't long before she's seeking the reassurance of her keepers. She's in there and uh, yeah, right now she's exploring the den and having a good meal. Settled in quite nicely. But a mechanical failure has delayed Trevor and Ping Ping in Hong Kong. OK, well, we just have to play it all by ear. Canuck will have an extra day to settle in before she meets her match. Ping Ping arrives 36 hours later. He's bigger than Canuck by almost a third, 1.2 metres, almost four feet tall in the hindquarters, and weighing 380 kilos, over 800 pounds. In the next two or three years, he could gain over 150 kilos, more than 300 pounds. Ping Ping has lived all his life with his mother and siblings. Now he's approaching independence, adulthood, maybe parenthood. For the next 30 days, everyone entering the polar bear dens must observe strict quarantine regulations to protect the park from imported diseases. Ping Ping keeps his cool, but maintains a playful interest in his new surroundings. Ping Ping is less cautious than Canuck. After 48 hours in a transport crate, he's quick to go into his den. Polar bears have an exceptional sense of smell. His first stop is the steel door that separates his den from Canuck's, intrigued by the presence of another bear. Canuck! Canuck! Hey, he's here. Yeah. No, I don't care. Look at this. Ping Ping has already taken to his chilled plunge pool. You can see the size of that paw and understand why they can swim so fast. He's, um, so he's still only very young, he's still only four. He's not fully grown yet, and he'll get up to maybe 500, 600 kilos. While the bears settle in, the keepers exchange information in spite of the language barrier. 17 years old, that. He's living with a 17 year old male, mm. fully intact, f uh, not castrated. So that is a child, No, it's not. That's I have never heard of two male polar bears living together. Aren't that here? Wow. Over the next few days, Leslie spends some time getting to know the bear who will eventually become Canuck's mate. What is that? Ping Ping is naturally more playful than Canuck, and he's been handled differently. In Beijing, the polar bears were left to play with each other with little human interaction and no toys. He's having a great time. It's been so much fun watching an animal that really has never had anything to rip apart or play with in his life. It's just been, it's been a blast. Every day we give him something new and every day it starts all over again. And they always wonder about that big door and they stand up and they try to look out the edges of it and even, even Canuck was doing that. I need a little bigger window so I can see outside. Yeah, we're talking about you. Oh, oh, he said he's getting mad. He said, I want this. I'm sure they're antsy to get out. I'm going to see some real sunlight. Both bears get their first dose of real Australian sunlight in the exercise yard outside their dens. The bears must stay in quarantine for almost three more weeks, but there's plenty to do, and Ping Ping is about to have the most important meeting of his life. It takes place in the corridor outside the dens. The keepers have left open the doors so the bears can choose their own timing. 
Ping Ping makes a submissive approach and waits for Canuck to respond. It's only seven days since the bears arrived. The introduction is progressing faster than expected. Until now, they've been aware of each other by sight and scent. This is their first chance to meet nose to nose. Right now, he's a bit scared of an old bear down there. He's still feeling a bit insecure as far as she's concerned, which from our side of things is really good. It's going to make introduction a lot simpler. He's a lot bigger, he's a lot stronger, he's a lot fitter and everything else, so he's feeling a little bit unsure about things. Much better behaved. The good thing about him is he's showing a lot of interest. He wants to meet her, he wants to get in there with her, but he hasn't shown the aggression part of it, so... That's all going to be really useful for us. Good boy. Over the next few days, there will be many meetings like these until it's time to release the bears together in the exercise yard. When the day finally comes, Canuck is waiting. After a cursory nod, Ping Ping seems more interested in other things. But polar bears can be devious, and in the wide open spaces, they like to keep their distance. Polar bears are solitary in the wild. They only come together with a male for breeding. Uh, so it's a very unnatural thing for a male and a female polar bear to live together. And that is about the most difficult thing that you're going to do with polar bears in captivity is get them to live with the opposite sex. So the polar bear union that will unite the captive gene pools of Asia and North America begins without real aggression. Canuck keeps the upper hand, but over time the balance of power will change. And as he reaches maturity, Ping Ping will become the dominant animal. It's the biggest worry facing uh, any institution, and certainly Seal World right now, is hoping that these two bears will get along. Canuck has to understand that she can no longer be top dog. Canuck remains top dog through the early weeks of her relationship with Ping Ping. But before the introduction is complete, yeah, Leslie sure. must say goodbye. Be happy. Don't worry, I'm going to hear about everything you do from Carrie, so you'll be a good girl. She's going to tell me what you're doing. I have to send Carrie a video of me. She can play it for you. Don't be mad at me. I'm leaving you with really good people. We're going to have more time to take care of you. They're going to have be more time to spoil you than I could. It's going to be a wonderful life for you. Two weeks later, the polar bear's new home is complete. A recreated summer tundra with icy waterfalls, a babbling brook and fog. The fine mist from hundreds of fog nozzles provides evaporative cooling, lowering the air temperature by up to 10 degrees centigrade, 15 degrees Fahrenheit. We'll put the rain on in zone two. Climate is controlled from behind the scenes. Des coordinates the special effects, some of them from movie studios, a rain machine, and wind generators that can create a gentle breeze or an arctic blast. Okay, not a problem. Uh, south fan turned on. We're going up to two now. Four. The keepers are fine-tuning the frigid atmosphere. Tomorrow, the bears move in. Inside the dens, they seem to sense that something's about to change. In the mythology of the Inuit people, polar bears walk upright and live in houses, only putting on their white fur coats to go out into the material world. The Inuit people believe the souls of polar bears are interchangeable with peoples and that the bears understand everything they hear. It's a warm December morning, typical of an Australian summer. At 9am the temperature's already in the mid-70s, over 25 degrees centigrade, and climbing. 
and the bears are about to be released. The keepers spread the bears' food throughout the exhibit, tempting them to explore every feature. Breakfast, sir. And after the keepers leave, the door is opened for two polar bears to enter a whole new realm, the Australian Arctic. The bears have already begun to lose their heavy winter coats, and over the next few weeks they'll reduce their layer of insulating fat, which can be four and a half inches or ten centimetres thick. Ping Ping, always more adventurous, takes to the water first, but he's in for a surprise. In Beijing, the pools were shallow. He could always touch the bottom, and he heads for the safety of a handy log and food. They're eating really well. They're eating about 12 kilos each day. Really, we're feeding them ad lib. We're feeding them what they want to eat and just recording what their preferences are and going from there. Canuck hesitates, reluctant to go in the water, but clearly tempted by the crowd. She's people orientated and uh, being able to swim up to the glass and sort of look at people through the glass is going to be a great experience. And she really loves people. And people love polar bears. Many biologists believe this could be the captive population's most important role. Bears in parks around the world serve as ambassadors for polar bears in the wild, acting as a rallying point for environmental issues, inspiring people to protect them. And the evidence is that people are more likely to care about a species they've met face to face. Polar bears are highly intelligent. Some researchers believe they're as smart as apes. Catering for their intelligence can be a challenge for zoos. A British study in the 90s found that polar bears provided with enough mental stimulation will socialise and explore as fully as bears in the wild. Chilled water obviously is important, but the ice and snow issue, that is not what makes animals happy in captivity or comfortable. There's a lot of other things that bears need to have, and we've incorporated those things in our exhibit. Polar bears are classed as a marine mammal. They can spend long periods of time in the water, in the wild swimming as far as 60 miles, 100 kilometers in a single stretch, pulling themselves through the water with their front paws, using their back feet only occasionally as rudders. The site is a revelation for the Chinese keepers. Because the pools in Beijing are smaller and have no viewing panels, this is the first time they've ever seen a bear underwater. totally enjoying themselves as well. He's a little bit shy, but uh, once she leads the way, he just follows on behind her. So she's teaching him a lot of things. No one knows how long it'll take Canuck's fertility cycle to adjust to the seasons of the Southern Hemisphere, or how long Ping Ping will take to mature. But it may be a year or more. When you're breeding animals um, in human care, there's a lot of elements that go into it. What we try and do is remove all the negatives. So. Yes, if she has a very comfortable environment where she can exhibit natural behaviour, we keep her mentally and physically stimulated, that's going to help. So we need to make sure that they have plenty of time to acclimatise to not only the new exhibit but to each other. She's a hand-reared mother herself, so she may not have de properly developed mothering instincts. We've got to be prepared to take action if necessary and hand-raise the cubs ourselves. It's very important that we, we breed these animals and, and we're confident that we will. Ping Ping's keeper Chung Yi Chow says they'll apply what they've seen in Australia to the polar bear exhibit in Beijing, introducing more playthings, 
more variation to the daily routine. It's now three years since SeaWorld began an exhibit that would break new ground for the captive care of polar bears. The obstacles of climate and distance have apparently been conquered by imagination and science. But this is only the start of another story for Ping Ping and Canuck as they continue to adapt to each other and the new environment. For a new generation of zoos, striving to improve techniques for keeping animals in captivity. And for scientists, strengthening the captive gene pool and continuing research that will help protect polar bears, now vulnerable in the wild. I think we all would rather see animals out in the wild, but I'm not too sure how long a lot of the wild is going to be there. And so we better get good at keeping them in captivity if we want to save them.